It's Retro Time! And this is an NES, a North American Nintendo, if you will, the Nintendo Entertainment System. This is rather large for what you might consider to be a rather old and not very powerful piece of hardware, but this was expandable. That was the big thing. Like you could use custom chips to make sure that your games would run whatever you wanted them to run. Basically, it, it kind of reinvigorated the video game market in the West, so much so that if Atari hadn't died, they would have licensed to this as the AVS. But Nintendo came back and they gave us this. Today, this is... Well, I mean, you can you can tell the shell has yellowed quite a bit. Like that's that's real hollow, right? And it's it's kind of pointless. So um, there's this project called Tininess, and what that does is it just kind of condenses everything, you know, makes it more I mean compact. Like the box for this is actually smaller physically than the NES itself. So let's put this to the side here and have a look at this. We've got kind of a preview on the box here as to how big the actual console is. It's not the size of the box. On the side here, we've got kind of, sort of public domain. It's not quite. This is a fairly permissive license. You can, I think, build this yourself. It's uh, not open source though. Made by Tall Dog Electronics, which I think, is that a maned wolf? Don't know. Tininess? Tininess? Genuine. Okay. This is where we need to talk about what the Tininess is. The Tininess isn't a modern recreation of the console. It's literally the guts from this shrunk down into this. The way they're able to do that is by harvesting chips out of those old consoles, or in the case of the non-genuine version, there are actually clone chips you can get that are completely, I think they still make them, or at least they're still available. They're not great in terms of compatibility, I think, and some graphical glitches can happen, but you can still build one of these completely from scratch without any official Nintendo components, which is just great. And on the back here, we get another preview of what it looks like, this time in 3D. Instruction manual of some kind. So it's powered by a five volt DC, uh, which enters the USB-C jack on the rear of the console. Okay, so I will need a USB-C power supply. Okay, yep, they have a provided USB-C power adapter and black and gold USB-C cable. You know what, I'm just gonna not read this any further because it seems like something I could just find out by unboxing it. And that's a lot more interesting, isn't it? Let's just pull this out of here and... Is this an actually just an Apple USB-C adapter? It's got an Apple model number on it. Either that or it's a clone. It doesn't feel like it's lightweight or anything, so it's probably legit, or legit enough for our purposes anyway. <laughs> That's pretty adorable. So I guess this uses a uh, TRRS connector here to split off into the RCA outputs. Yeah, this doesn't have HDMI or anything fancy like that. It's just the original type of outputs that you would have gotten on the NES itself. Unless you were like me back in the day and you used this, which is even worse. Let's see, we've got a Tall Dog sticker and an Allen wrench. I guess they intend you to open it up, which is great, because I'm gonna do that. Uh, and here is the console itself. That actually looks really sharp, and it's so tiny. Like, okay. It's a little bit shorter in this dimension than an NES cartridge. Okay, a little bit wider and yeah, a little bit thicker as well. Games, I suppose, just go in like that with the label facing that way. Oh, that's interesting. There's actually already RCA jacks on the back of this. So apparently this connector here that goes in here splits out all of the individual audio channels. So if you've got expansion audio in your Japanese Famicom game, then you can get that and mix it separately from the built-in audio. So I guess if your game is too loud on the expansion audio, which is the thing that can happen, you can kind of mix it separately or you can just mix it the way you want to. Interesting, I'm not sure why. Uh, also, apparently this can be configured for RGB output and I'm not sure how you would do that exactly. Remember what I said, the license for this thing was pretty permissive? Well, here's the block diagram of the whole console. It's just right there. Find all the components and you can put them together in the same way that the console is put together, which is pretty sick. They even have the bill of materials here. And according to this, you can install an RGB capable picture processing unit or PPU. Uh, the original NES didn't actually have RGB output in the traditional sense. It's PPU basically just spat out more or less 
composite video, which has been an issue for a while because if you've ever noticed that like emulators and Wii Virtual Console and everything else seems to have different colors, that's why. What colors you were supposed to get out of the NES were not really set in stone. They varied from console to console, basically. Back to the console itself, we do have our video. We've got the reset button back here, which is kind of an interesting place to put it because some games kind of relied on the reset button on and off switch back here. That works. It's kind of sharp. I would have preferred maybe a larger switch, but it is powered with Type-C. On the front, we've got traditional NES controller ports, so I can plug in my traditional controller, my NES Advantage, or if I had a CRT to plug this into, my Zapper. I don't have one of those here today though. And on the other side, there's nothing. Oh, right, there is one more thing, and that's this little dial down here. It's a potentiometer. That is what you would use to adjust the levels of the, like the balance of the uh, the internal audio and the expansion audio, like I was explaining earlier, uh, in case you're only using the onboard output. And that's basically it. This thing is super basic. Aside from that, we've got some, I guess, nice looking, but basic cables for uh, audio, video. That's literally all you get. You got your, your mono channel for audio and you've got your video. And we've got this nice uh, USB type C cable. They're all braided, which is nice. Uh, I'll get these out of here and we'll power it on. But first, I'm gonna talk to you about our sponsor, Vessi. Thanks to Vessi for sponsoring today's video. Soggy sock season is upon us, which means smelly foot season is also upon us. And it's time to put those boat shoes back on the shelf. Vessi makes water resistant sneakers that offer you reassurance when the weather report simply can't. And trust me, right now uh, in Vancouver, it really can't. Their Dymatex material will keep you warm in the winter, good thing, and cool in the summer also a good thing because then you have sweaty feet, right? They're comfy, breathable, and lightweight. They're also 100% cruelty-free and vegan down to the glue they use. Keep your feet dry and save $25 with offer code short circuit at vessi.com slash short circuit. Now, before we get into this, I've got a game genie here. Yep, okay. Sure, that's that's not weird. Oh, uh. Oh, 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 that's a tight fit. Uh oh. Ugh. Okay, so <laughs> one thing you might have noticed is that took quite a bit of effort to get in and out. In contrast, the original NES, a lot easier. All right, let's power this thing up. Uh, you got me a monitor? I was just setting up to, well, set this up, when I realized that we have some more boxes. Here we have a cartridge latch. Not sure what that's about. Maybe that would have helped with this. And a Famicom adapter, which will let us use this in this as well. So if you're not familiar, Famicom and NES slots differ fairly considerably. Famicom is significantly shorter. The cartridge itself inside of this is actually probably the same size as the Famicom version. They just made them this big so that they could slide in and out of this much more easily. Let's take a look at the Famicom adapter and see how that works, because as it stands, that's that's not really gonna work. Hey, that's fairly robust. Okay, is this 3D printed? It's a pretty high quality print if so. So I guess this would go something like this, and then we would slot uh, the other way. Huh, okay, the other way. So I got it wrong the first time around. It instead slots in like that. This will work on the uh, actual NES as well, but this particular adapter is not really suitable for that because it won't give you the ability to kind of reach in and kind of get it. It'd be useful for a top loader, which is what this is. Now, the cartridge latch. I have no idea what this is supposed to be. What is this for? I see, I, I think I see. You ready for this? That makes it a lot easier to get your game out rather than just like, like you can't can't just do this. Anyway, how about we finally plug it in and turn it on? <laughs> Power it on, see what comes up. Is it gonna be stretched? Is it gonna be weird? No, it's Super Mario Brothers 3. What you are seeing right now is actually a fairly good quality output. Composite video isn't known for its sharpness, but this isn't terrible. I kind of expected worse. Uh, the Koopas there are not doing so hot. That's kind of what I was expecting. <laughs> but that means that the circuitry in this is actually fairly robust in terms of cleaning and filtering 
the output signal, making sure that there's no interference, that kind of thing. Okay, let's play. Okay, input lag is... Well, I mean, it's it's original hardware. Input lag should be nothing. I pre-compensated there for a jump that I thought was going to take a little bit longer for, to register, but it's instantaneous. Uh, the D-pad feels a little bit slippery. There's a 8-bit Doe controller. Yeah, maybe I'll switch out to the 8-bit Doe controller, see if the uh, controller port in the front here has enough power to handle a Bluetooth transmitter. All right, let's switch the controller out. Not quite original style. It's fairly close. Actually, it looks like it's pre-yellowed. It's like the same color as the other one. Oh. <laughs> right. I think this is a thing that can happen on real hardware too. Well, I say real hardware, the original hardware. If you plug in something that's power hungry, like the Bluetooth dongle here, it'll reset the console. Uh, the 8-bit drill controller, this feels a lot stiffer. Yeah, this feels really tight. Uh, this D-pad's a lot better. Well, it's a lot firmer. It's, it's more defined. The other controller's D-pad was worn in. Let's just put it that way. After getting past, or I guess through the first level, the audio sounds pretty good. I can't turn it up, unfortunately. This monitor doesn't have a volume control for some reason, but it sounds pretty good. I don't hear any like buzzing or anything like that. No, there's not even any levels coming through right now on this pause screen, which is something that would never be the case hmm. on my RF. NES. Now composite video on its own is going to have some problems. This is probably the best case scenario for like upscaling it with the uh, RetroTINK 5X Pro here, which itself could probably do for another review because this thing has been updated significantly. Honestly, this is a really clean composite output. If this were plugged into a CRT, I don't think you would really notice any composite artifacts at all. Like the floor there, not quite where the status area is. That glitching is actually normal, but uh, you can see there's a little bit of like fuzz going on down there, but it's not as bad as I would expect. You know what was bad though, back in the day, to my recollection, was Mega Man. So let's throw that on and see what, ooh. Sound. Whoa, look at that, just comes right on. So yeah, the, you can see the, the kind of fringing between the, uh, the white and the red on the three there. And also in the logo up there, there's a little bit of like fuzzy flickering. That flickering is also normal for this game. The Robot Masters look pretty good here. Uh, I remember a lot more fringing around the uh, the stage select, um, like the borders there. Yeah, I mean, it looks, it sounds great. I mean, obviously it's original hardware, so it's going to. Uh, I don't know if Super Mario USA has expansion audio or not, but I'll throw that in real quick just to kind of test it. And then we'll take it apart. Is it just me or is like the composite artifacts way worse on this? I usually don't play Mario in this game. How about I take it apart? They thankfully include a nice little Allen wrench. And I think, yeah, they have points here that tell you how to get it open. It's the right size. All right, cool. That, that's it. This right here is the original NES picture processing unit. This right here is the original NES CPU. Yeah, they're both socketed. So if I wanted to, I could pry up the picture processing unit and replace it with an RGB one. And I think you can also get a replacement rear module here that gives you RGB output. So if that was a thing you wanted, if you didn't want all of those composite artifacts I was talking about, then you can do that. And more of that white plastic in here. I don't know if you can see that, but there's little tabs in here that are kind of, you can push them inside. So it kind of grips the cartridges a little bit better. Yeah, they get pushed out. Otherwise, the cartridges just kind of like plop on there and kind of do that. And yeah, on the PCB, it's got cart blank side and cart label side. What are these switches for? Are these overclocking switches? Yeah, NTSC and PAL. So I could switch it over to the European standard for video. Think I would need a different PPU for that though? Now I mentioned these chips are socketed. On an original console, they probably wouldn't be. I don't think they would be at all. And the reason being, they were specific usually to each region or console um, production run, but they wouldn't have been interchangeable because the actual board layout would have changed slightly to support that other processing unit. So in this case, that's what those switches are for. So if I were to pop out, there we go. That there is a Nintendo CPU. Well. That was a lot easier to take apart than it was to put back together. If you wanted to go with clone hardware, so not an original NES, then you're looking at 209 US dollars, which is steep 
for the proper hardware, you're looking at 229, and that's for the unit you're looking at right here. With that in mind, would I recommend it? I think as a kit, like a hobbyist kit, it might be a lot of fun for somebody who wants to, you know, get their hands dirty with, you know, soldering and socketing chips and that kind of thing. For like intermediate users, that might be a, uh, a value add. In terms of just playing your games, I don't think this is really the best way to do it. Granted, it is very small and it's very convenient like to put on your shelf compared to uh, like the NES is on. We didn't have a place to put it. The NES is on the floor. All the components except for the CPU and PPU, uh, if at least for the original ones, those will be brand new. And it's powered with USB type C, which is super great, especially considering the NES uses nine fold AC, just ridiculous. For all but the most hardcore, like Nintendo retro enthusiasts, I, I, don't, I don't think I would recommend it for that much money, especially when you can get a Raspberry Pi if you really wanted to, or like you can get a fairly baseline mister set up for that. And I guess that's really it. Honestly, really nice looking, but I don't think I could recommend it for any practical purpose, but I can recommend Short Circuit for you. We have plenty more like this one and unlike it as well. So get subscribed.